So my uh, slides are all obscure uh, lyrical references, so if you're lost, you're probably not alone. So the topic of this is exit only, how to avoid five million German marching bands. When I was a young transgendered kid growing up in the middle of the woods in Canada, I felt that my access to music was very limited. Like a lot of kids born in the 70s and 80s, I had access to my parents' record collection, so that's pretty much what my first connection to music was, and they had quite a few gems in their collection, Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and all this kind of thing, so that was what stuck with me for my whole life. However, when it came to going beyond this collection, that stopped growing mysteriously in 1977 when I came around. Uh, getting access to more recent music became more difficult. Uh, during that period, I spent a lot of time taping mixtapes from my dad's records, and like a lot of guys, my father had a soft spot for stereo equipment, so we were always trying to get his LPs onto cassettes so that he could have more of his music available without taking up the whole living room with his vinyl collection, which is something that my mother would have never stood for. And when I turned 13, all I wanted to do was move to Seattle and be 10 years older like everyone in that Cameron Crowe movie, Singles. I was going to wear plaid shirts and torn denim and have complicated relationships with similarly tortured people, be a singer in a band and scream about my angst. And I learned uh, that I had angst from Maclean's magazine, which is a lame Canadian version of Time magazine. We did an article about Generation X, a group that I was too young to be a part of, according to them. Uh, their article ended Gen X with 1975, which is a very contentious position, to say the least. But so it was that Maclean's magazine added the insult of exclusion to uh, the injury of my seclusion. And uh, when I, what started back there in Canada has uh, been a lifelong obsession with access to music. And this is going to sound like one of those walking 60 miles through snow to get to school kind of stories, but we actually did have only one channel. And it was fuzzy most of the winter, and uh, the only access we had to music videos was on a program that was on Friday nights that was cancelled in 1993 called Good Rockin' Tonight. It's like, uh, I can still remember it. It was Terry David Mulligan, who was kind of a Canadian uh, actor who... Yeah, he was in a lot of Canadian movies. And uh, so he would start off every program with, have you heard the news? There's going to be good rockin' tonight. And he kind of went... <sighs> yeah, but... So all of a sudden, in 1991, the situation improved dramatically for me. I got access to loads of magazines that all of a sudden they broadened their distribution or something like that to reach Nova Scotia. And uh, so that's what happened. Basically, we, uh, we got access to the alternative press and Spin magazine. And Rolling Stone had always kind of been there, but that was kind of more focused on things that I wasn't that interested in. Uh, so through that, I got access to Sonic Youth, who pretty much curated my life from that point onward. And uh, Thurston Moore pointed me in the direction of hardcore punk and noise rock. And uh, through that, I arrived at Minor Threat and Fugazi and Discord Records and uh, Ian Mackay, who, who ran that. And then I got to the question of ethics in the music business. So I was much too far away from Washington, D.C. To, to benefit from this personally. Uh, you can see where I am there and where D.C. is. But the Discord crowd had a very simple idea about how to give people access to music. They made well-produced punk rock albums and sold them at affordable prices so that kids like me could afford them. And uh, Fugazi kept their concert tickets low uh, in price for that same reason and made sure whenever possible to play at all ages venues so that, again, kids like me could get into places that, you know, otherwise we were disenfranchised by, um, you know, not being able to go into bars. Of course, I'm speaking as if I was actually there. The, the truth is, just reading about this was exciting enough for me living in Nova Scotia, and uh, we didn't have any access to this at all. But, um, but it got me pretty excited about what was possible out there. And uh, while this was going on, there were endless uh, articles about my favorite bands and endless discussions about who was selling out by signing to the majors and all this kind of thing, something I think you're going to hear about from Dutti afterwards. But uh, I moved to the city to go to school, and people talked ad nauseum about a local band called Sloan who had signed to Geffen, and it didn't go well for them, and they were going to come home from their adventure in the United States and uh, you know, release their albums on their own label and all this kind of thing. So there was a very kind of like active discussion about what it meant to be into indie music or into you know, major label stuff or whatever else. It was all a political thing that you were doing by buying your records. 
And by this point, I was pretty much an indie label devotee, and I was taking in as much as I could. I'd spend all my time at record shops, going through the CDs when I was supposed to be studying. I mean, I was at university, but I was spending literally all of my time in Sam the Record Man down on Barrington Street in Halifax. And this was still Nova Scotia and still Canada, and anything that you would really want to get cool uh, was only through mail order, which was kind of a tedious process of money orders and everything like that. I'm going to sound like a total complainer at the end of this, but, but that's seriously how it was. So that's, it's, I'm just building up the whole thing, so bear with me. <laughs> so uh, a further story. Toward the end of the school year in 1995, I watched my friend download an MP3 for the first time, and the track was Army of Me. And it was the first single off of Björk's new album, uh, Post. So there's Army of Me <laughs> on his uh, Mac <laughs> computer that he had at the time. So it took all day to download. And as we sat there watching the progress bar, I remember thinking, this had better be good. <laughs> and when the 32 kilobit per second file finally arrived in that computer, it was horrible. It sounded so bad. Like the song, it was fine, you know, but it sounded like <laughs> just like totally distorted and everything like that. I don't know if you know that song, but it starts with a very kind of like distorted bass line and all this kind of thing. And uh, to this day, I can't hear that song without kind of hearing it through that kind of crunchy, like poorly compressed uh, kind of horribleness. But, but it was very impressive. And I mean, you all know what happened next. The bottom dropped out of the music industry and Everyone started using Napster, and um, the internet made librarians of us all. And uh, if you fast forward to just under a decade, it's a bit overwhelming to think about how people are spending their time these days, um, and how much it has changed. But uh, one important thing hasn't changed. Artists are still getting really shitty deals from people who exploit their material online. And uh, so, all of this together is kind of what drove me to quit my job as a contractor in the IT industry here in Iceland and devote all my time to making something called Fair Play in Music, which is what we do at Gogo Yoko. So the idea behind Fair Play in Music is similar to what you see with other fair trade initiatives, is that, um, like with coffee or community trade stuff that goes on at uh, the body shop or whatever, um, although it's nowhere near as established, and the tendency to pay people working in the music industry unfairly is a very firmly entrenched phenomenon, um, as you may or may not know. And whether you run a music festival or a music store or an electric press kit, uh, electronic press kit site, the reasons for exploiting are the same as they are for any other situation uh, in the world. You exploit because you can. And artists are compelled to create, and will do it whether you pay them or not, so the situation is really ripe for the picking for, uh, for this. So to turn this situation around would really take a business run by artists, and there are actually quite a few of us out there. So what would a fair deal look like when a company makes 100 million euros selling ads and subscriptions to their music service? Uh, how much of that belongs to the content creators? And by that I mean the songwriters and the performers and the labels and the artists and all these people. How much of that is actually going there? And this question sends the directors of these companies scrambling for their lawyers because to be fair, you know, this is a low margin business and you pretty much have to sell your soul if you're going to try and get the kind of market share that companies like Spotify are after, right? But fairness is also a weaselly kind of concept, too, because when it comes to payment, one person might tell you that it means everyone should get pay paid based on how much work they put into it. Another person might say everybody should get paid the same or whatever else. But for now, I'm going to stick with a payment per use. And uh, with music on the internet, I mean, you can pay for a downloaded copy of the music or pay for access to the stream, or you can get the, the music for free. Uh, which is subsidized by advertising or something else, uh, you know, corporate sponsorship or something like that. And in the world we now live in, when you release an album, you're going to sell less than you did uh, 15 years ago. And the cut that you get for each track has become a more important issue than ever before. So the first change that has to happen here is that we put more of the sale in the hands of the creators, because it's the internet. I mean, you, your stores don't have stock rooms, they're not occupying square feet in the shopping district. Uh, making new copies is almost free, so, I mean, after you've paid tax and royalties to uh, collection societies and all this kind of thing, it's really important that more of it goes to the artists. Now, obviously, iTunes doesn't need to justify anything to me, uh, sitting here in Iceland, and they're the, you know, 
big technology company and everything like that, but I'm willing to bet that they don't need 30% of each one of those things you know, to cover their costs of distribution. So then there's the cut of, of subscription and advertising revenue and all this kind of thing. And when GoGoYoko has been talking about this revenue model in the past, people have been pretty skeptical to say the least. Um, but this is something that we've been building up over about three years now. And it now turns out that this is the way all of the subscription services are going. So you either make this model work or you get out of the business. So we also decided uh, at GoGoYoko to focus only on independent labels and artists uh, from people recording in their bedrooms all the way up to companies the size of Beggars Group, uh, which is one of the largest independent label groups in the world. And that refocusing of music services on mu music, cur um, excuse me, that refocusing of music services on music curation, like uh, just filtering for people and getting you know something to you that you want to hear. Uh, is going to be the next big change in terms of access to music. And I'm going to be able to subscribe to a specific service that's going to feed me what I want to hear. And it doesn't matter anymore if the service is going to have 15 million tracks or you know, this whole thing that people are always talking about, the number of tracks that you have. Because those details are really only of interest to the internet librarians that the Napsters and Pirate Bays of the world assume us all to be, which we aren't. Um, I mean, what good basically, are 15 million tracks if 5 million of them are German marching bands. <laughs> and I believe that the current system treats us as mindless consumers of random data, but happiness isn't coming from spending our time downloading content off the internet. I'm not saying I know that firsthand, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I want people to, uh, I want music to be seamlessly integrated with everything that I do. But it's like my father said to me when I first showed him Napster, I don't want to spend my precious time negotiating the intricacies of theft. And so curated access, preferably by a panel of well-paid music nerds, is the way forward. And we are returning to the type of access that I wanted growing up in rural Nova Scotia, and it's going to be wonderful. So thank you very much for your time.